Hello and welcome to State Matters. I'm your host, Matt Miratori. Today, we will be discussing county government, specifically Plymouth County government. Joining me for that discussion is the newest member of the county commissioners being elected in November 2020. He's a lifelong resident of Rockland. He served in many civic and charitable capacities. You can also hear him live every Wednesday evening on WATD 95.9 FM from 6.15 to 7 p.m. as the host of the JV team. Please join me in welcoming County Commissioner Jared Valenzuela. Thank you, Rep. Muratori. A pleasure to be here as Thank always, you. Thank sir. you for coming. We appreciate My that. My pleasure. Yeah. It's great. I don't usually get to be in front of a camera. It's well, I, I, I said before we got on, you, you look better on radio, actually. I, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. So let's see. We always start off our show is just, just to get to know who our guest yeah. is. So... You know, I, I got a little bit of your background here. So just talk about, you know, you know, you, you grew up in Rockland. Just talk about your background and what you do and other than county commissioners. Yeah, happy to. So as you mentioned, I grew up in Rockland, a uh, lifelong resident there. I went to Sacred Heart in Kingston, uh, which is a lot of fond memories. Actually driving here sort of brought some of those back. I'm down Route 3. Uh, I remember Colony Place when it was just woods uh, yeah, as right. they were getting yeah. ready to build that. So uh, certainly a lot of changes in the area. Uh, graduated Sacred Heart in Kingston, Massasoit in Brockton and Bridgewater State University, so I've stayed in Plymouth County pretty much What did you get for a degree? Entirely. Like political science. Political science, uh, With yeah. public administration concentration. So nice, nice. Uh, I've been able to utilize that off and on throughout my professional career as well as sort of doing politics as a side mm -hmm. hobby. Now it's sort of a melding of both. On top of being a commissioner, I'm active in the real estate uh, industry as yeah. a real estate agent oh. uh, and also uh, do other sales of furniture and other supplies as well. So yeah, yeah. sort of a jack of all trades and uh, yeah. trying to do our best here to... Well, the keep, real keep estate markets, that's a pretty interesting market now. <laughs> it's a, it is. It's tough, you know, and it's interesting how real estate will tie into uh, the county uh, government because that's, a, by and large, a lot of our revenue is derived right. from deeds excise. Right. Um, the last couple of years, obviously, with the refinances, we've had a significant, uh, on the county side of things, a significant number of uh, revenue that has come in above our projections. On the real estate side, where there's been such a lack of inventory, prices have been through the roof. Yeah. Um, now that rates have shot up as quickly as they did from 25 to 3% to about 5.5% now, you know, for dollars and cents for folks, if you're going to make a lateral move, that's the difference of six to $800 a month in your yeah. mortgage payment. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's nothing out there anyway. So right. if you're sitting there thinking, I'm, I might want to sell, well, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Yeah, and, that's uh, the problem. Yeah. And it's tough. You know, hopefully, I, I think there's going to be a break. Higher rates will usually mean lower prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully... Some buyers out there. I know it's a very discouraging market for buyers right now. Mm -hmm. uh, folks are looking to sell. You know, feel free to, you know, feel free to reach out. It's mm -hmm. it's a seller's market for sure. Yeah. It won't be this good again for a while. For a while, yeah, 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 yeah. You're also. Um, I've been a, a member of the Knights of Columbus since 1980 in Rockland, actually, uh, your hometown. Yeah. Because I lived in Rockland for a number of years right. as well. Um, Council 165, and you've been the Grand Knight for six years. Talk about that a little six bit. Six years, yeah. So it's we a long were, time. Uh, yeah, yeah, it has been. So I joined the Knights in about 2011 and uh, got active pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Started as a treasurer, then deputy Grand Knight. Uh, like anything, it's sort of uh, who wants to be the Grand Knight, and I was the only one still standing forward. <laughs> everyone and, stepped back. Everyone yeah, stepped yeah, back. Yeah. Um, you know, the Knights of Columbus is such a wonderful organization. Yeah. Folks who who don't know, it's um, it's a Catholic. Uh, fraternity, mm -hmm. uh, mutual benefit society, so one of the largest uh, life insurance companies mm -hmm. in the world right. with one of the strongest products uh, available. But on the local level, we do a lot of uh, charitable things as, as it relates to supporting the local church, veterans, scholarships. So we've had a scholarship fund, and we're proud to maintain that mm -hmm. as one of our main uh, drivers for fundraising. Sure. And we like to have some fun, too. You know, we have dances and we have mm -hmm. softball leagues, as mm -hmm. I think you recall you were on. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was in the years. softball league for probably 15 years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I was still doing those. It's a funny story. I, I actually found I was actually with Tom O'Brien. We actually, yep. we, we played for a number of years together towards the end of my playing. I think I ended in 1993 or 1994. It was to the point, I think I was like 43, 44. It was to the point that you played double headers on Sunday. Right. And I couldn't walk till Thursdays. <laughs> and I'm like, why am I still doing this? Right. So I finally yeah. left it. But we had a great time. I still have my jacket from, I don't remember what, it was 1980s that we won the state championship, yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah, I still have I think it. we still have the trophy somewhere. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, one of the cool things, though, I had found, uh, the council itself just turned 125 wow. in 2021. Wow. So now it's 126. Wow. And um, upstairs in the attic of the hall, I had actually found the first book of the first minutes taken wow. in the council in April of 1896. Wow. And the cover was disintegrating. 
so I'd actually found somebody often, I think it was North Attleboro, mm -hmm. who could actually rebind it. So mm. uh, we have all of our records preserved from April 1896 through the present day, uh. which is also a really cool thing. You know, you look through it, um, one, of the, one of the neater um, portions of one of the minutes books was sending a letter to Congress lobbying for the creation of Columbus Day oh, uh, in the wow. 1920s, 1930s, wow. and records of that. Wow. So, you know, it's interesting. Of yeah. course, the dues back then were a little cheaper, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, my dues haven't changed in all these years. Yeah. It's still paying the same. Yeah, it's we've worked very hard yeah. to maintain yeah. that. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's come with some come with some effort, mm. but we're proud to be I was a recording that. secretary for a couple of years, so you may uh, come across yeah, yeah. with the big book and that's some all of that yeah. recording. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, one last thing that's fascinating, you talk about this a lot on your show. At, on the JV team is Paul McCartney. What's your fascination <laughs> with Paul McCartney? Well, you know, I love the Beatles. Yeah. And um, as I say, I love all four of them equally, right? Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but you weren't around when they were. No, I was not. And John Lennon was dead for many years before yeah. I was even born. Right. But I don't know what it was. You know, I got the Beatles one CD, there yeah. you go, for, uh, for a birthday present. And I just listened to it. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was hooked ever since. Uh, and I got my start in state service with uh, former state senator, uh, for Duxbury uh, up to Weymouth, Bob Headland, who's now yep. the mayor of Weymouth. And um, I was actually fortunate to meet Paul McCartney. We uh, presented, we, Senator Headland, uh, when he was in the legislature, used to file legislation to ban the elephant bullhook, which is what they would use at circuses to mm -hmm. bring elephants sure. around. Paul McCartney's been an animal rights activist for 50, 60 years. And uh, Senator Headland really wanted to recognize him for his effort in bringing awareness to the humane and ethical treatment of animals, and one thing led to another, and we met him. And I always like met him in person. Met him in person. Wow. Yeah, and that's on YouTube. You can check that out. Uh, it's my first time on YouTube. I will <laughs> well, say this will be your second time. Second time, yes. <laughs> I made a few more in between. What I will say though, just to tie up the McCartney story, he was super down to earth, super nice guy. But I can't give enough credit to Bob Headland. Mm. Uh, he had said to McCartney, and, and you know, as a legislator, mm. when you are present, you mm. will present your resolution or citation mm. to the mm. recipient. And uh, Senator Hedlund at the time said to McCartney, Jared is a huge fan of the Beatles. He's a huge fan of yours. In my 20 plus year career as a senator, I've never done this before. I'm going to let him do the honors of presenting oh, you with the wow. citation. So my joke is the Queen of England and I have something in common. We both presented Paul McCartney <laughs> with, with recognitions from our governments. <laughs> where was that held? Fenway Park. Oh, nice. Where he will be well, returning well, in Was that June. when he was here for his concert? His first yes. concert? Yeah, yeah. I actually was at that concert. Yeah. Great yeah. show. Yeah. And ah. I'm looking forward. I'll be seeing him. He's, he's touring in June in the yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, so I'll see him in Syracuse, ah. Boston twice, and then... The metal what a great show. What a awesome great show. show. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's talk about county government. So yeah. a lot of people, and specifically Plymouth County government, a lot of people, you know, don't understand county government. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in other parts of the country, county governments are pretty yeah. big. Around here, there's not many of them, um, but Plymouth County is pretty active. So if you could help explain Absolutely. in simple terms how, government, how county government works with the state, you know, with the towns and funding and all that stuff, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, and as you allude to, and, I, and I, we, I'd be remiss not giving uh, you credit, Representative, been very supportive of Plymouth County uh, in your time as, as a legislator, as has your colleagues, Rep. Lenatra, Senator Moran, and many others in the area. Um, so Plymouth County government, as you alluded to, there are 14 counties in Massachusetts, seven of which no longer exist, just names with lines and boundaries. Plymouth County, uh, with Norfolk and Bristol, have the general same sort of general structure. There's some nuance to some of the other ones left. Um, many years ago, when we were first formed in 1685, so I can trace my county commissioner seat back to 1685, we did provide a lot of services that now we come to know and love from our towns and from the state, so roads and other infrastructure as well as sheriff's departments. Uh, but over the years, a lot of that has been sort of peeled away. So now Plymouth County... Peeled away to the state. Peeled away to the state, to the state uh, yeah. or in general seated locally. Yeah. But a lot of your state roads, if you see a county road in your town, that was built by Plymouth County. And we still have all those old road maps from two, three hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. um, now the county's main roles and functions, it's also interesting, and I'll just note this, uh, as a governmental entity in Massachusetts, we're the only ones that aren't allowed to tax, which I find to be sort of ironic. Is that unique to Massachusetts? or Well, just, in, the, just in, in the fact that is there any state or government agency in Massachusetts right. that can't tax? Right, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> um, right. And I'm not complaining about that by mm. and large, but... Mm we become very constrained for revenue. So we mm -hmm. still own a man we still own the Registry of Deeds buildings. We work very closely with our registered John Buckley in that capacity. Most of our revenue is derived from deeds excise receipts as well as the assessments we pass on to the towns. Uh, some of the services that we have been providing and one of the things that we like to say and, and again I'll also be remiss I have to give credit to Sandra Wright and 
Greg Hanley. There's three county commissioners. Three county yeah. commissioners. Mm -hmm. Those are my two colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, Treasurer O'Brien and uh, Frank Bowser, our administrator. We are the best bang for your buck um, in terms of the services that we have been providing. Uh, we offer the burn vehicle grant, which is uh, a, an opportunity for communities to purchase uh, in a group bid. Uh, vehicles, which is cheaper than most other group bids, including, I believe, still cheaper than the Commonwealth. Uh, we offer the Mayflower Municipal Health Group, uh, which has provided great services and rates to the member communities. Well, um, now, is that the retirement? No, that is the health insurance. Health insurance, yeah. okay. okay. So the retirement So the retirement we also offer, um, both to our employees' Plymouth County Retirement System, but then there's the OPEB Trust. And what I think is great about the Plymouth County OPEB Trust is it began in January of 2015, and... Oh, I didn't realize it just yeah. started. Oh, that, yeah, it oh, just okay. started. So oh. folks who, who don't know, other post-employment benefits is sort of this albatross, or I should say this grand piano that's hanging over the heads of every community, not just in Massachusetts, but nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's being able to pay for a employee's uh, health insurance and other benefits post-retirement. So Plymouth County uh, found uh, that as an issue and created what we call our OPEB trust, other post-employment benefits. Um, and they began that in 2015. By 2022, they had thought that, and when I say they against Treasurer O'Brien and us, the commissioners, that we would have about 14 communities and $28 million in service. We actually have 29 communities now and $50 million in service. 29 communities? 29 communities. So other communities outside of Plymouth County okay. have joined our OPEB really? Trust because it's So unique. all 27 within Plymouth County and a couple more? Most in Plymouth County, okay. some are outside of some Plymouth County. Okay. Um, okay. We're still going around if there are communities that, that tune in outside of Plymouth County yeah. that are okay. interested. You know, okay. we're, we're willing to bring anybody in. It's yeah. had one of the best returns on investments of any other post-employment benefit trusts across the state. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly another service in, in, that we've been providing and been expanding is our 4-H program, uh, Molly Volmer. In, that's been around forever. Yeah, 4-H has, in terms of coming through Plymouth County, uh, that's been something that's also been relatively new that we've tried to onboard. Okay. And I should note, we have done this without having generally any increase in our budget. Our budget is modestly 10 to $12 million per year. So we've been able to bring on all these services uh, that a lot of folks, some use, some utilize. You see the 4-H program at mm -hmm. the fairs and out and about in Plymouth and in the area. Um, we've expanded those programs without having any means of adding new revenue. Uh, it's just folks that have rolled up their sleeves and recognize the benefit that Plymouth County can bring to uh, to the county in terms of bringing regional services. Um, they're out and about doing dog trainings. Uh, we have an entomologist. I had to write yep. that down. Yep. <laughs> Blake Dinius, so if you see mm -hmm. a bug that you're not sure of, you've never seen before, you can take a picture of it, mm -hmm. send it to him. Uh, he'll let you know what it is. We've built a greenhouse on our farm and we really want to thank Sheriff Joe McDonald and his staff for their help. Uh, in, in creating that agriculture program for Plymouth County as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're working very hard in trying to provide a lot of services for our communities. Uh, certainly down the road, I think we're looking at a lot of opportunities for regionalization. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. A lot of services that are happening in towns that are more expensive because 27 communities, as you alluded to, in the county mm -hmm. are doing it 27 times. Uh, and the county is, is working very hard to become that outlet for communities to be the vehicle for streamlining. So, like, re yeah, regional. I've been talking about that for years. Trying yeah. to regionalize some services. You know, one of the services that was discussed a few years ago was maybe like Board of Health. Maybe a, if the county yeah. could do like Board of Health, but it's all about funding. Of course. Yeah. It, well, it is. And the thing is, funding and there's some there's some statutory things as well. Uh, whether it be a Board of Health or some other issues. Another one I know we're looking at or have looked at in the past is IT services. Mm -hmm. There are so many communities that don't have or don't have the capacity to have an IT service. And as we know with ransomware and phishing and all the other mm -hmm. uh, technical buzzwords that are out there that are real and legitimate, uh, we see them, I mean, the Plymouth County's, you know, every, every um, town and government entity has at some point had a ransomware uh, mm -hmm. attack on it. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just a fact of life in 2022. But a lot of communities can't afford to pay for IT services. You know, Plymouth County, again, ranges from Brockton, which is a, a large, mature mm -hmm. city, mm -hmm. uh, Plymouth, which is a large town land-wise and population-wise, down to a community like Plimpton with, with a couple of thousand people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a really diverse county in terms of population mm -hmm. and um, demographics. So there are certain things that some towns can afford and others can't. Plymouth County is working to be at the ready for, again, especially a lot of the smaller communities to help be a vehicle to regionalize services and provide certain things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the the structure of it, you mentioned there are three county commissioners, yeah. there's treasurer, there's the, the county administrator, and the town. So can you talk about a little bit about the structure? You mentioned Brockton is the largest city, yeah. the Plymouth is the largest town, and how that works for voting. Sure. So the commissioners are staggered four-year terms. Uh, so myself and Commissioner Hanley are up every presidential election year, and Commissioner Sandra Wright is up this year, and she's up every gubernatorial year, for lack of better, yeah. every midterm year. Okay. Um, we have four-year terms. The treasurer has a six-year term. Uh, he was just reelected in 2020. He'll be up again in 26. Uh, Register Buckley, whose organization still uh, interacts with the county commissioners, is also a six-year term. He is up in 2024. Um, the way our structure works is very similar to to a town, um, for lack of a you know mm. for a great example. The board of county commissioners, which is our formal title, is much like a board of selectmen, except we're countywide. Uh, our legislative branch, we don't have town meeting or elected town meeting. We have an advisory board. Um, so an advisory board member is a member of the board of selectmen from each town and a city councilor from the city of Brockton. What's unique about our advisory board, though, is the vote is actually weighted based on the property valuation. So it's not a one, one person, one vote structure. It's based on your property valuation. So I believe Hingham has a higher share than Plymouth um, and all the way down to Plimpton whose share is, I think, 0.15% of the vote. So it's a, that part is really interesting. It is, yeah. Because uh, between us and Barnesville County does it that way as well. Uh, it's the only evidence of any government structure in the country that isn't one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. um, and we interact with them. They pass our budget. Again, it's, it works just like the governor and the legislature or the president and Congress uh, or, again, a board of selectmen in town meeting. We, we propose our budget. They, they pass it, hopefully. They usually do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they, they with check. little controversy. With little controversy, <laughs> hopefully, um, and they pass it. We don't have you know a thousand amendments to it, thankfully, yeah, yeah. because again, yeah. it's very modest, and, and all the things that we talk about again is is done within a ten to twelve million dollar yeah. Uh, budget. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of budget, I, I know um, uh, the county owns some land in Plymouth. Actually, your offices are in Plymouth yes. as well. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You also own some land in Plymouth, and recently there was some uh, discussion about um, a lease. You're going to le lease the land. Yeah. It was a public process, and there was a discussion about horse track racing. So you wanted to maybe talk about that process sure. and how that came to be and yeah, what's was, the next steps maybe? Absolutely. We certainly appreciate it. So as, as we've alluded to, you know, revenue for the county um, to be able to provide a lot of these services, thankfully we've been able to provide them within that, within the constraints of our, our revenue model. When I was elected, one of the things that I looked at were potential opportunities to generate more revenue. And I, being in real estate, spotted 100 acres of land mm -hmm. uh, in Plymouth. And uh, it's the old wood lot. For folks who don't know what the wood lot was for, it was literally a wood lot. When the jail needed heat 200 years ago plus, the prisoners would go chop the wood to heat the jail. And it's right down the street from BJ's and Home Depot. Yep, yep. It's right off exit 5, Long Pond Road. I think you'd head down Camelot Drive as mm -hmm. one of the access right. points. If he is, it was landlocked. There was no access mm -hmm. to it. Um, my predecessor's board, um, Dan Pilata was on the board at the time, uh, sought to purchase a couple of access points. Uh, one of the things that we did, real estate, anything you value is really in a matter of what someone else is willing to do there. Mm. Um, so for us with the county, we don't have the capacity ourselves to do something there. So we decided to put out a very general request for proposals. So Mass General Law Chapter 34 will govern how any government entity can utilize land. So we put out a general request for proposals to get an idea of what might be out there for a possible use for that land, not to sell, but to lease, because the county was Is there an option to sell if you wanted to? We did not put that in the RFP. But you we, could if you wanted to. In theory, we could, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. In theory, right. we could. Okay. Um, it's not something myself personally, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but mm. I, I think I generally can in this instance. Mm. We're not generally interested in selling it unless we got bold over. Well, you're looking it. for ongoing revenue. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you yeah. sell it one time. And in the county, you know, the history of the county, in at least recent history, we had to sell land to make payroll at some time. So mm. we're certainly very proud. And again, credit to uh, my predecessor board and, and the county treasurer, uh, Tom O'Brien, for being able to get us to a point where we're not doing that anymore. Uh, but now also being in a position where we have a parcel of land that we can try and generate revenue from. So we put out a generic request for proposals. Seven groups took it. I was sort of liking it to baking a cake. You put the recipe out there mm -hmm. and you take the recipe. We only got one return proposal, which was an entertainment facility anchored by, by horse racing. 
Uh, I was intrigued by the proposal. We certainly vetted them and made sure, obviously, you, I couldn't show up and propose to build something like that. Right. I don't have the capacity. I'm not a, re a responsible or responsive bidder. Uh, we had deemed that the group that was, uh, a group uh, with one of their partners from Kentucky, uh, with vast experience in thoroughbred horse racing, uh, was a responsible and responsive bidder. Uh, we've been going through the process of um, making sure we are following the law. I had a public hearing, and, and we were grateful for uh, the residents that showed up at the public hearing. Uh, and we've heard from multiple towns, and I've heard from multiple people on both sides of it. I certainly understand, um, you know, again, as I, I talked earlier, the ethical treatment of animals is something that, that is very important to me, and I don't say that facetiously. So mm -hmm. certainly really doing independent research and thoroughly vetting uh, how that organization treats those animals was extremely important to me uh, as well. So that's something that, that I made sure I vetted before, before going forward. Um, and the process is ongoing. You know, I think a lot of times folks look at things and feel like they come out of nowhere and they're done deals, and they're really not. We're going through a process. We, we've heard from, again, folks all over the county on both sides of the issue, uh, and we're taking all of that into consideration as we continue to go through the process uh, with the developer. But I think what's really important for folks to take away from this is Plymouth County is not building anything. Plymouth mm -hmm. County is not. Plymouth County has land that we are optimistic someone may be able to to build a something, revenue generating yeah, right, uh, entity yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think we do need to say too that uh, in the recent town election mm -hmm. non-binding question uh, I think it was um, several thousand votes mm -hmm. very little blanks and you I think the Board of Selectmen race had like 2700 blanks <laughs> right. this one had a couple hundred blanks mm -hmm. so people really came out to vote yeah. for this non-binding question do you want thoroughbred racing in Plymouth or not? And it was 88% no to 12%. How do you think that's going to affect it moving forward? Well, again, it was, it was non-binding. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I, I, I care about the opinion of the residents of Plymouth. Mm. Um, we'll take it into consideration, much mm. like any, any bit of information. The folks who showed up at our public hearing, um, the results of that question. Um, it's, it's a balancing act, being mm -hmm. countywide, because mm -hmm. it's a parcel of land for the county, and mm -hmm. I know it's in Plymouth. Uh, certainly, if this were to come to fruition, mm -hmm. uh, the town of Plymouth would likely see mitigation of Long Pond Road and increased tax revenue. So while they are certainly bearing the potential impact, they would mm -hmm. also reap the potential benefits, whereas other communities would only have the benefit of what the county was able to generate in revenue. So. Um, trying to take a global look while also being mindful uh, of local uh, thoughts and concerns mm -hmm. uh, has been a real interesting component of my, as you, my first year as a commissioner, is sort of trying to balance yeah. you know, someone's opinion in another community. And to some degree, they're not wrong and their opinion isn't less, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're a member of Plymouth County as well. Mm -hmm. And this is county land for the benefit of the entire county. Mm -hmm. But again, being mindful of uh, and respecting uh, the will of Plymouth residents and Plymouth voters as well. Um, I can assure you, and, and we will continue to keep an open mind, follow the process as we are instructed to do so by Mass General Law, Chapter 34, keep an open mind. And again, nothing is, nothing is ever firm or final mm -hmm. uh, until, you know, until we get to the mm -hmm. end of that process. Yeah, and the county just leasing the land has nothing That's to it. do with the yeah. process or anything else. Correct. So. Yep. Um, and, um, Sports betting is coming to Massachusetts, as you, right. as you see, it's going to happen. And the Gaming Commission, they are looking for thoroughbred racing they somewhere are. in Massachusetts. Um, I just wish a, a town would just raise their hands and say, come to us. <laughs> I know. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet. Well, but. it's interesting. You know, you, it, it, and look, I'm not, I'm not a gambler. and I'm mm -hmm. ambivalent towards, towards mm -hmm. horse racing. I, I'll watch the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, the town of Plymouth receives a lot of lottery revenue. Yeah. And every convenience store, I, I love Plymouth. And mm -hmm. I admittedly come to Plymouth a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I prefer Plymouth to go into Quincy or Boston mm -hmm. at this point. I really sure. do. A lot of um, people do, yeah. It's just, it's, it's quicker, it's easier, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. nicer in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but every bar or restaurant you go into has Kino. Yeah. Um, so, you know, gambling is a vice, and gam but gambling is here. And mm -hmm. every community, not just Plymouth, 351 communities across the Commonwealth have benefited to the tunes of billions of dollars mm -hmm. uh, in the last 50 years of the Mass State Lottery. So, uh, so that component, again, you know, when you look at the type of individual it might attract, I know a lot of folks bring up Suffolk Downs. Mm. Suffolk Downs, I think, is in Revere. It's not really convenient. Mm. Uh, it's in a different part of the state. It's got a different 
clientele a different base. Right. Uh, I think in not just specifically thoroughbred horse racing, but any type of entertainment facility I could be there up to and including maybe a convention center, maybe mm. uh, a, a sports stadium complex. Um, you know, if you build a high-end, classy establishment, you're going to attract high-end, yeah. classy folks. You know, right. as, I, as I've often quipped, Tom Brady flying to the Kentucky Derby's not entirely a bad thing, is it? So, right, right. you know, maybe we'll have them at Plymouth Municipal Airport coming in for, <laughs> for, for something someday. Uh, I'm not sure. Who knows? Yeah, but, yeah, you know, we're yeah. certainly we're certainly going to continue on the process and, and take everybody's thoughts and concerns into consideration. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, we got a couple of minutes left, so I just want to switch gears a little bit. Um, COVID. Yes. You were elected during COVID. God love you for <laughs> running. You. I don't know how you did it. You <laughs> were elected in November sometimes. 2020, so you were in the height of COVID, yeah. and, and you won. Congratulations. Thank you. But you guys also did something very unique with yeah. COVID money. Can you, in the last two minutes we've got left, time sure. to talk about that? Yeah, so real quick, and I appreciate that. And again, your support in my race was, I'm grateful for that. Um, it was very difficult to run. Certainly, um, you know, grateful that there were some considerations taken into account, up to including signatures. I mm. had to get 1,000 signatures right. to get on the ballot. And, um, you know, the, the state saw fit to at least cut that number in half. Because mm -hmm. how could you go out? You couldn't stand in front of a supermarket. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't go to anyone's doors. Right. Um, so I, I'll give the Commonwealth uh, a lot of credit for making some necessary adjustments uh, to allow folks to run. Frankly, I mean, I think I still turned in close to 1,000 signatures mm -hmm. certified. I wouldn't have made it. Um, but I'm glad you allude to the CARES Act. Uh, in March of 2020, the federal government passed the, the CARES Act. And in the Treasury and in the language, they allocated $90 million to Plymouth County. Uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts demanded not only just of Plymouth, but of Norfolk and uh, Bristol as well. They also had an allocation that we give the money back to the state. Uh, and again, a lot of credit to my predecessor, Dan Pallotta, um, as well as Greg Hanley, Sandy Wright, mm -hmm. and Tom O'Brien for standing firm in the face of mm -hmm. unrelenting, I mean, it was unrelenting, right, right. not only from the state, but from towns as well, but a lot it, of communities. But it worked out. How much money did you it give It worked out. out. So of the $90 million, we've received national recognition. We administered the program for less than 1%. Mm -hmm. $89 million were dispersed back to all 27, all 27 cities, cities and towns. And, towns. Yeah. and to do a quick comparison, every city and town in Plymouth County got two to two and a half times more money than like-sized communities outside of Plymouth County. Uh, I believe the town of Plymouth got over $10 million, yeah. uh, whereas the like-sized communities got seven. Uh, so we're extremely proud of that. We received recognition from the National Association mm -hmm. of Counties uh, for our administration of it, as well as congressional mm -hmm. uh, recognition from Representative Stephen Lynch. Uh, the CARES Act is winding down. We're now yeah, on you know, the opera, and you're going to be giving out more money. Jared, May thank 26, you. May 26th, 2.25 yeah. million to plummet. So. Excellent, excellent. Darren. Thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you, Rep. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. And thank you for what you're doing with the thank county you. as well. And Thanks for all you keep do, up, Keep up the great work. Thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching today's show, and you could catch Jared on every Wednesday at 6.15 to 7 p.m. on WATD 95.9 FM. On the JV team, I want to thank the staff here at Pack TV. Thank you, Julie, for pitching in for Donna today. Thank you to the guys in the booth for another terrific show. And I want to thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time on State Matters, where we'll be celebrating our 100th show. See you then.